probably just taking this on your lunch break. So, well, look, you're all very, very welcome here today. I'm Sarah Kyo. I'm a dietitian with the Celiac Society. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is myths of celiac disease. And I'm going to pop up some slides here in a second and we'll go through them. So just as a little bit of housekeeping, we are recording this today. So you can leave your cameras on or off, whatever suits. Um, but just do make sure you're muted because otherwise anything that happens in your background is going to be on the soundtrack for this video. Um, we are going to take questions in the chat. So those of you who aren't familiar, if you go to the bottom of your screen, if you just with your mouse, you'll see on the bottom, there's a few different things, but there's a little thing that says chat. And if you click on that, you can actually pop questions into that. And at the end, I can read those questions and answer them for you. So I'm going to start off and pop up the slides and we're going to just take you through myths of celiac disease. So just to say this um, session is also sponsored by Shar, who very kindly given us some funding for it. And what we're going to start off with today is have a look at very basics. What is celiac disease? Sorry, I lost my slides there. Where we go? So what is celiac disease? And I'm not sure if everybody here has celiac disease or maybe some of you are curious about it. So what we have is that celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. And this is where your body um, your body's own immune system sort of attacks itself. And it really the big focus on it tends to be in the gut. And if you have a look at this picture here, you can see two sort of blocks and one block has these big long fingers sticking out of it. And these are called villi. And their job is to dip into your food as it goes by and absorb your food as it goes through your gut. But in celiac disease, when you eat gluten, the gluten attacks these villi and it flattens them and you get these shorter ones. And the problem here is that it's more difficult for your body to actually absorb the nutrition when that happens. So celiac disease is very common. We, it affects one in every 100 people. And if you have someone in your family who's celiac, your chances of being celiac yourself is then one in 10. So this is why if someone is diagnosed with celiac disease, we'll tell them that they need to get, you know, brothers, sisters, children, parents, everybody, your first degree relatives should all be tested for celiac disease as well. So it's not an allergy and it's not a food intolerance. So even though it is triggered by gluten, it's a slightly different um, process in the body and mainly affects the gut. Now, the thing about celiac disease is there's lots and lots of ideas and myths out there about celiac disease. And, you know, sometimes it can be people with celiac disease themselves. It can be with health professionals. It can be with friends. It can be with families. So what I want to do is just go through some of the myths today and see um, how we get on with those. So the first one, myth number one, is that celiac disease only affects the gut. Now, pretty much everybody with celiac disease will have some gut sort of factor in there. And generally, when we look at the biopsy, we do see gut damage with that. But celiac disease can affect lots of other parts of the body. So it can affect people's bones. It can affect fertility. We see impact on skin. Some people get skin rashes. We see effects on nerves. And a lot of people will see hair loss as well. So we have lots and lots going on with that. So lots of different places. So when we look at celiac disease, what are the gut symptoms with that? Because some of the gut symptoms with it that you're going to see quite a bit, you'll see diarrhea, bloating, constipation, abdominal pain, indigestion. Some people might have nausea. Some people will be lactose intolerant and that's usually just temporary. So somebody with celiac disease who's lactose intolerant, generally after about six months on the gluten-free diet, most people that will be able to tolerate lactose again. And some people will have weight loss as well. So for about 60% of people with celiac disease, they will have gut symptoms that are strong enough for them to think, I need to go to the doctor with this. But that means that 40% of people with celiac disease don't. So we can see lots of other symptoms. And what do these include? So we might see nervous system symptoms. We might see people having anxiety, depression, headaches. About 25% of people with celiac disease, when they're diagnosed, will talk about having very severe headaches, which go away um, once they're on the gluten-free diet. A lot of people will have fatigue or tiredness, might have exhaustion, brain fog would be a common symptom. Um, but some people can have, have their balance impacted, they might have numbness and ataxia, which is problems with coordination. And we know that about one in five people with celiac disease will have what we call neurological symptoms. This is nervous system symptoms with it. Other things that we see would be vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So a lot of people might be picked up a celiac because their iron was low every time it was tested, or they had a low vitamin B12, or they had a low vitamin D. And these are all reasons that if someone has these, 
that your GP might send you for a celiac test. And if you've repeated low iron, so if you've had lots and lots of iron tests and it's low all the time, you definitely need to have a celiac test because about 40% of people whose iron is regularly low um, turn out actually to be celiac. So if there's no other explanation, you know, sometimes people could have low iron because maybe they've had really big surgery and there's been some blood loss and things with that. But if there's really no general explanation for why you're, you might be anemic, definitely worth ruling it out with the celiac test. We see issues then around skin and teeth. So people with celiac disease that's undiagnosed can get more mouth ulcers. Um, and we do see a lot of really on the ball dentists picking up people with celiac disease because people are having recurrent mouth ulcers. Um, children and adults can have poor tooth enamel. So sometimes the children, if they've been celiac for a few years, as their adult teeth come in, they actually come in with poor enamel. And that's again, a big red flag for checking for celiac disease in children. The other thing we see is a skin rash called dermatitis herpetiformis. And um, there's a couple of examples of it here, but the most common one is this front of So um, one of the most common ones, sorry, I think I am muted at the moment, am I? No. So one of the most common ones is that, um, sorry, I've jumped ahead here, give me one second. So when we look at dermatitis herpetiformis, this is a very, very itchy rash. It comes up as a blister on the skin, but it's so itchy, everybody scratches it. And that's where you get these kind of scabs with it. And around 10% of people with celiac disease will have this particular kind of skin rash. Now, what I often see is people who've had this rash for years and then are diagnosed with celiac disease. And they go, oh, by the way, I've had this rash, but actually the rash is celiac disease as well. And sometimes there's a little bit of confusion with that because sometimes people think, well, you can have celiac disease and you can have dermatitis herpetiformis, but they're actually all part of the same disease. So if you have the, the dermatitis herpetiformis, us, you are celiac and you do need the gluten-free diet as well. Now it does take quite a while to go away if you have it and um, so once you're on the strict gluten-free diet it does actually take around two years to actually go away altogether so don't panic if it's if it's taking a while for the skin to get better that's quite normal. In children, we will see maybe weight loss, slow growth is quite common. So maybe they're just not growing as fast as other children or suddenly they were meeting all their normal targets, but suddenly then they slow down a little bit. So maybe a child is a lot shorter compared to siblings. So if all the other siblings are kind of fairly tall and there's one child and they're just down, you might think, mm, let's check that one out. Um, as I mentioned, poor tooth enamel and mouth ulcers, but for children, low energy, tired, they're just not, you know, kids are generally in good form and, and going with a child who's just a little bit lethargic, a little bit tired. Often they, they'll talk about being anxious and maybe some difficulties at school because they might not be concentrating. You might often see in younger children some fussy eating, but where they're fussy, that the foods that they're not eating is things like bread and pasta. That's always a red flag around celiac disease as well. So links with other conditions as well. Um, so as we talk about the gut an awful lot with celiac disease, but we know that if someone has early onset osteoporosis, um, that that can be an issue, arthritis, infertility. So someone who has repeated miscarriage, there's an increased risk of stillbirth. And if someone has type one diabetes, Down syndrome or Turner syndrome, they're more likely to have celiac disease. And the same if you have an underactive thyroid, you're more likely to develop celiac disease as well. People might also have early menopause or delayed puberty and lots and lots of people do see hair loss as well. So that's having a look at the symptoms, but what about some of the myths? So myth number two is that you should try a gluten-free diet. And I see this a lot. So this is where people think, well, maybe I am celiac. So, you know, I just go gluten-free to check. Please don't do that. The big problem there is that if you go gluten-free to check, and you feel better, the last thing you're going to want to do is go back on the gluten to have your tests and you do need to have your tests done. So it's really important that if you think you at all that you might be celiac, you need to go for your blood test, you need to keep eating gluten, go and see your GP, your GP can do the blood test for you. And from there, your GP will let you know if you need to go on and have a biopsy as well. So don't no trials of gluten free, just absolutely definitely um, keep eating your gluten until you've had all your tests. Myth number three is that a negative blood test means you're not celiac. Now, in most cases, a negative blood test does mean you're not celiac. However, we do know that between three and 10% of people with celiac disease will have a negative blood test. And it just isn't 100%. So the blood test is a screen for celiac disease. It's not going to diagnose it on its own, um, but it doesn't always completely rule it out. It just gives you an idea of what you need. So what we would say is that for most people, you know, if you have um, a negative celiac blood test, but you're still having gut symptoms, and especially if celiac disease is in your family or things like that, you know, your doctor would probably send you on for a biopsy anyway, just to rule it out, just to be careful. So I said, particularly if celiac disease is in your family, because it's just a little bit more likely that you're going to go on to develop it as well. 
Myth number four is that food intolerance tests are useful not for celiac disease and in fact they've kind of a little bit of a limited use really a lot of the food intolerance tests or food the tests that are marketed really as food intolerance tests would be things like igg vega testing and hair analysis and unfortunately most of them don't diagnose um, food intolerances and the hpra in ireland there about two years ago had a statement out talking about particularly igg food intolerance tests and this is where you would take a sample of blood and you send it off and you'll get a list of foods back, you know, like a red and a, an amber and a green and it'll say, you know, high reaction to whatever foods doesn't mean you're intolerant to them. What it actually tells you is that you've just eaten a lot of them in the last few weeks. So what those tests will tell you is what you have eaten recently. What they don't tell you is what you're intolerant to. And this is why someone with celiac disease might have these tests done and gluten won't come up as an issue for them because most people who are celiac aren't eating gluten. So it won't have been in their system to be picked up on the test. But it, it's just to be careful because I've seen a lot of people confused by these. So they might have been diagnosed with celiac disease and then they have maybe a food intolerance test done. And then they go, oh, actually, you know, it didn't come up as gluten. So maybe I'm not celiac. As I said, these tests only tell you what you've been eating recently. They don't diagnose food intolerances. So just be very careful with them. So again, if you think you might be celiac, it's into your GP, have the proper blood test done with your GP there. That is going to be the most important thing to do. Myth number five is that you can be diagnosed with just a blood test. So we've said like, you know, we're looking at the blood tests with this. This is actually a little bit different for adults and children. So for adults, um, the blood test is the first step to diagnosis. So once you have the blood test done, then you're going to be sent for a biopsy. Really important to keep eating your gluten between your blood test and your biopsy. So I see this happen a lot. People have a blood test. Yep, looks like you're celiac and they go great. And they stop their gluten. So of course, by the time they get to the biopsy, um, everything has gone back to normal. And the biopsy goes, oh no, no, you're not celiac. Whereas actually they might be, but they've just cut out the gluten. So re and we see this a lot in the celiac society where people have you know, taken out the gluten before they've been fully diagnosed. And it's really, really important if you can tolerate it at all to hang on in there and get your proper diagnosis with this because otherwise people start looking for other things. you know, And you're being checked out for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but actually the issue is celiac and you just want to get your diagnosis rather than dragging it out for yourself. With children, it can be a little bit different because with children, what we do know is that if they have the blood test, which is your TTG in particular, and if your TTG is more than 10 times above normal and you have symptoms and a pediatric doctor, a pediatric gastroenterologist has checked it out, they can be diagnosed on that. So if it's very, very high and an experienced doctor um, has seen that, then she can be diagnosed with celiac disease with just a blood test. Now, because of COVID in the UK recently, um, some adults are being diagnosed on the blood test alone if it is very, very high. And that has just been to do with restrictions around COVID. It's definitely not in the guidelines. Now, there's a lot of research at the moment going, looking, well, can we do that for adults? Do we have to make every single adult have a biopsy? The reason sometimes we would do the biopsy as well is just to make sure there's nothing else going on, because unfortunately, you can have celiac disease and, for example, Crohn's disease or things like that. But at the moment, the guidelines are very clear that you should have your blood test followed by your biopsy for adults but with children they're going to see a pediatric gastroenterologist blood test may or may not need the biopsy with that if the blood test is quite high myth number six a gluten-free diet is easy and you don't need a dietitian and um, well i think any of you who are actually living gluten-free will tell anyone it's not easy um, to be strictly gluten-free it is not easy to be missing every single bit of gluten all the time it's actually quite difficult and you know we have a lot of research on this now we know that most people do accidentally have gluten at some point even when they are being very careful that it can just come in I would highly recommend that you do see your dietitian. Obviously, I'm biased because I am a dietitian. But what we do have is the research showing that people who don't see a dietitian, um, over 60 percent of them are still eating gluten years later. And we particularly see that in children. If the child wasn't referred to a dietitian and um, parents actually have difficulty identifying gluten free foods. Now, not all of them, they will get the big ones, you know, the bread and the pasta, everybody gets that. But the big problem where I see it is the cross contamination. A lot of people just don't get that information, but it's not just about gluten. Remember, when you're celiac, we are also looking at key nutrients like vitamin D, calcium, the B vitamins, the iron. We're looking at weight regain for people who've lost it and especially catch up growth for children. We also know that people with celiac disease can also have differences in, in liver function, cholesterol, things like that. So we need to check all of that. It's not just about gluten free. That is the big, big, big thing. But we need to look at all of the long term health for that as well. So what the guidelines are is that when you're diagnosed, you should ideally see a dietitian within two weeks. 
um, and then six months later for a checkup and then once a year from there on in. And it's useful just to have that checkup because over the years, things do change. You know, when I was qualified as a dietitian about 25 years ago, Rice Krispies were allowed. But as we got better testing levels for um, particularly barley malt and things like that, we realized actually they're not suitable. So that's why they're not. Um, so things do change. You know, there's differences with it. So it's worth just doing that checkup and that guide so that when you go back once a year and have your blood tests, like your vitamin D, your B12, your thyroid, you're going to get those checked every year. Check in with your dietitian. Your GP can refer you to a HSE dietitian. And you can be followed up there or we do actually run a dietitian clinic at the Celiac Society and we can see you there as well. So just really important to make sure that you do get to see your dietitian. And if, you'd, if it's a long time since you've seen a dietitian, maybe just get a check in for yourself there as well. It's number seven and is that a little gluten won't do any harm. Now, I have to say, I often call this very unfairly, probably on some of it is the grandparent um, rule, because we do sometimes see, you know, if you have a parent and they've been strictly gluten free with the child, sometimes other family members are like, well, could you not just give them one biscuit? Like would one biscuit really do them so much harm? And it can be quite difficult to actually explain the impact that that can actually have. So we know that as little as 20 milligrams of gluten, per kilogram of the food is enough to trigger a reaction. Now that sounds very technical, but if you think about it like this, do you remember when you were in school and we did half and a quarter and a 10th? Well, if 20 millionths of the food has gluten is gluten, that is enough to trigger a reaction in most people. So yes, a very tiny bit won't do. So I love this cartoon where it says, can you not just scrape off the crumbs? There was an article, I think in, in one of the newspapers there a couple of years ago, and they were saying about silly things people do in restaurants and one of them, was someone saying, well, I saw this person get a burger and they said, oh, but I'm gluten free. And the, the waiter or waitress had said, we should just take the bun off. And they're going, well, it still touched it. And they're going, oh, what an idiot. And you're going, well, actually, that, that's totally correct. If you serve a burger to someone with celiac disease with the bread on it, it is now contaminated with gluten. So it really is just tiny bits and a little does do harm. Now, for some people, it can make them sick very quickly. Other people, it might not be as bad, but it will cause damage on the inside that can take a few days just to heal. So unfortunately, we do need to be quite strict with that. Myth number eight, that you grow out of celiac disease. Thankfully, this one seems to be dying a death. Now, certainly 30 years ago, um, really people did think that you grow out of celiac disease, you don't. What actually happens is that as children come into puberty, the changes in the hormones through puberty actually temporarily change the effect of gluten. Now, it doesn't mean that your teenage kids can rush out and eat gluten. It still does a lot of harm, but they won't get quite the same reaction with it. But obviously those hormone surges pass and you come back to normal. So un unfortunately, people don't grow out of it. And my big concern is there's lots of people I'm meeting today in their 60s and 70s who were diagnosed celiac as a child and then around 10 or 12 were like, oh, you're not celiac anymore. And now we are seeing the really bad osteoporosis and, and lots of other issues that have happened. So if you were ever diagnosed with celiac as a child and you've been back on gluten for a few years, will you go and maybe pop into your GP, get the blood test done and just see where you are again? So we do know now that celiac disease is for life. Myth number nine, that you can be slightly celiac. Um, I hear this a lot and I often say this is like being slightly pregnant because to be honest, you're either celiac or you're not. There's no half measures with this at all. The confusion comes down to a few things. And what it, the big one really is that some people when they eat gluten get really sick. They get, oh God loves them, they get really, really sick. They might have two days of vomiting and diarrhea and cramps and brain fog and exhaustion and they are just wiped out. Where someone else eating exactly the same meal who's celiac won't get that. And not that they won't feel fine. Some of them do. Some of them might feel a little bit bloated, but the reactions can be quite different. And so the people who don't feel too bad think, well, maybe I'm, I'm not as bad a celiac as the person who gets sick, but it's, it's on or off. It's black or white. You're celiac or you're not. Unfortunately, it doesn't just balance out like that. So the problem is that you'll all have the same gut damage. So whether somebody gets sick or someone doesn't, what's happening on the inside, you're still getting the damage with that. Now, the good news is there's quite a few drugs in the pipeline that we think will be able to reduce the impact when someone actually eats gluten. So if you're someone who does get very, very sick when you eat um, gluten, there's a couple of drugs. Now, I have to say the bad news is they're probably five or six years away, but we have some nice research coming down the line looking at that that might be able to reduce the effects of that for people who really get um, a bad reaction with it. But no, nobody is slightly celiac. Unfortunately, it's, it's bad all the way. So myth number 10, and I'd say most of you might have come across this one, um, is that spelt is gluten-free. And I do often see lots of foods 
that are marketed or put out or just accidentally people think well they're gluten free so the big one is spelt and i still see posts on social media talking about spelt being gluten free spelt has slightly less gluten than other wheat now remember spelt is wheat so it does have gluten and it has lots of gluten less than maybe some other versions of wheat but it is still there so just watch it kamut is another grain that's kind of coming onto the market again it's another type of wheat um, sourdough bread does also include um, gluten unless the whole ingredients are gluten free. So if you make sourdough bread with rye flour or wheat flour, the sourdough process does not remove the gluten. OK, it still has absolutely lots of gluten in there. And I was working with a lovely, lovely chef who was genuinely um, saying, oh, we can put sourdough bread on. I was like, not unless it's fully gluten free. Couscous is another one. Um, couscous is, is pasta. Now you can get a rice couscous, which is gluten free, but ordinary couscous is just wheat and semolina as well is wheat. Um, so that's one to watch too. And just a word on non-celiac gluten intolerance. So we think that this is for people where they, they don't have the celiac genes, so they're reacting to gluten, um, but it's not celiac, but actually it's still giving people reactions with it. And it can be similar in terms of bloating, maybe diarrhea, constipation, and just general discomfort. Um, so it is a reaction to gluten and people need to avoid it. Now, estimates vary on it, but we think that up to 400,000 people in Ireland might actually have an impact on it. And just to let you know that the Celiac Society is there for people with non-celiac gluten intolerance. So really anybody who needs to avoid gluten um, for their health is, is very welcome. So just in summary, we do know that up to 40% of celiac symptoms actually happen outside of the gut. So, you know, we don't often think about celiac disease if we have osteoporosis at a slightly younger age. We don't always think about it for things like migraine. And obviously those things can have other causes, but just something to flag up, especially if it's in your family. Um, you know, we need to think about it in if someone's having fertility issues, either becoming pregnant, um, and that's for men and women, if there's difficulty becoming pregnant during pregnancy, if there's repeated miscarriages or stillbirth, that's something to consider. For girls, if they have a late onset of periods, um, early menopause would be another sign and things like recurrent mouth ulcers and iron deficiency anemia. Just bear in mind, it actually takes up to 10 years for a patient with celiac disease to be diagnosed in Ireland. And that can take up to 14 years in the UK. And that's again, because we're sometimes we're very, very focused on the gut symptoms. So just in terms of the Celiac Society, I know many of you are members, but those of you who aren't, we have a lot of benefits for people who are celiac. So we produce the food list every year, and this looks at foods that are, are free from gluten ingredients, but also we look at the cross-contamination because that's the big issue. And um, you can have lots of foods that will say, oh, there's, there's no gluten ingredients in them, but what are they in contact with in the, in the factory where they're made? And we really, we work closely with a lot of food manufacturers on that. We provide help and supports. So we've helplines, um, you know, email we've lots of people looking at foods and different medical concerns and we can help people out with that as i mentioned earlier we have a dedicated dietitian clinic for people with celiac disease this year we ran our first minding me gluten-free course and that was a six week course where we had recipes we had exercises we had mindfulness we did a whole lot of articles on nutrition and just hundreds of people signed up for that and i think it went really well it's still available to members if they want to log on and join the, the all the information is there we are going to be starting celiac awareness week and um, now in may and you're going to be able to sign up for that shortly. And we're really delighted that hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a launch of the Food List app. So we will still have the book, but the app is going to launch um, with well over 5,000 foods on it. And we'll just be adding to that all the time. So that's going to be available to members. And we're really just looking forward to that. So if you're not a member, you can join today. You can join at celiac.ie and we look forward to having you there. So thank you very much. And thank you to Shar for supporting us today. I see that we've absolutely loads of questions coming into the chat. So I'm going to start and um, go through all of those. Um, and just pop up and we go to the start with them. Um, so first question is unexplained infertility with a low egg count an indicator of celiac disease. So the low egg count, no, wouldn't be an indicator of celiac disease because that would have been something that you're actually born with most of the time. But it can still be a factor in there because sometimes people can have difficulty becoming pregnant, even if the, um, you know, even if the eggs are there. So it would be something that we would generally take a look at with it. Um, now, sorry, no, just. So someone's saying balance problems associated with celiac disease. I was told this. Is this something to do with an area in the part of the brain affected? Yes, this is absolutely true. Now, it doesn't happen to everybody with celiac disease. And you can have balance problems that are not caused by celiac disease. But depending on it, sometimes um, we talk about, you know, the TTGs that everybody's had tested. So these are... Um, 
little molecules in the body and they cause damage. And there's a couple of different types. So there's one type that particularly damages the gut, but there's a couple of others and they can actually travel into the body. And they're the ones that can lead to the osteoporosis and they're the ones that can lead to the fertility, but they can also lead to damage in the brain. And so for the balance, it's often damaged in what we call the central nervous system. And if it's actually caught early enough, actually a lot of people, it'll recover um, really quite well. So yeah, loss of balance can be the thing. So you'll know, obviously, if you go on your gluten-free diet, hopefully that should come back to normal for you. So that is there. Um, the gluten-free symbol, I recently bought a real ad with no allergens in bold and the front of the box said free from gluten with sort of oblong stand showing a line through the wheat. I thought it was fine, but I was feeling off for the next four days. Is this symbol wrong? And if not, why say free from gluten? Um, I need to see the product. And actually, if you have any record of it, you know what it was. If you can send it into info at celiac.ie, we'll get our food team to actually have a look and follow up on the product for you. And um, technically, if it says gluten free on the box legally, it should have less than the 20 milligrams of gluten per kilogram, which is the, the legal standing for it. So one of two things, either there is gluten in it and there shouldn't be, or there was something else in it may, maybe making you feel sick. Um, you know, we were at a conference recently and they were saying, well, actually, sometimes someone gets sick from eating something and it might be gluten, but actually it could just be food poisoning. Because that, as I often say, you, know, you have celiac disease, but other stuff can still make you sick, unfortunately. So I'd love if you actually, um, the person who posts that question, if you can send us what the food is, we'll check it out. Um, because if it is got gluten in it, we do need to find out and let people know. So that's going to be really important. Um, you mentioned food intolerance tests not being accurate. Is blood tests sent to Pyrex labs in the US accurate? Um, I'm not familiar with the Pyrex lab, so I can't say for definite, but what I would say is if what they are testing is IgG, so if you have a look, the, the information they give you, IgG testing does not diagnose food intolerance. And as a dietitian, I can say there's pretty much no test that diagnose food intolerance. Um, really, you'd have to use what we call an elimination diet. I wish there was a blood test for it, it would make my life so much easier. Um, but none of the blood tests that we see for it will diagnose it. Sometimes there's some breath tests that you can do, but I would be really careful about where to go for those because, again, they need to be done very, very carefully to be correct. But in terms of the, the blood test for this, if it is an IgG, I would save my money. Um, if you want to know what you ate in the last three weeks, just write it down as you go. And after three weeks, you'll know exactly what you've eaten and you can save yourself a couple of hundred euros on that um, with them. They, as I said, the HPRA have a statement. If you want to Google that for yourselves, just being very, very clear about it, because I find they're quite expensive tests. And, um, you know, in terms of actually diagnosing food intolerance, I don't find them useful at all. Can this recording be sent out to us as my daughter is at school? It would be interesting. Well, I'm, I'm fairly sure it's going to be available on the website. But again, if you email at info at celiac.ie, we'll come back to you directly with that. Um, question, why would you not scope children? Well, unless we really have to, we don't want to. It's one of those things like it's very safe. It's done actually very routinely for children, but it is a procedure. Children can get a little bit frightened. Parents get absolutely terrified. Um, so, you know, if we can avoid doing invasive procedures for kids, we are. We like to avoid doing them for adults, too, as far as possible, which is why we're looking at, you know, the idea of maybe looking at the blood test at high levels being diagnostic for adults as well. But there's no reason not to. If your child does need a scope, the, the hospitals are very, very good and very experienced at doing it. So I wouldn't be worried about it, but it's more just if we don't have to put someone through it, we're just not going to. Sarah, what blood tests should I ask my doctor for to check up on my gluten-free diet so I know I'm not eating any gluten? Is that a TTG? So the blood test we would look at to see if there's gluten coming in roughly would be TTG. However, it's not an amazing test for that. So the TTG gives us a bit of a clue. So if someone is eating a lot of gluten, they will have quite a high level. But sometimes you can have a very low level of TTG, but gluten is still coming in. So it, we use it as one of the many ways of tracking how someone is getting on on a gluten-free diet. So for me, what I'll be doing um, is I would look at what are they eating, going through their food. I would look at someone's understanding of cross-contamination. So, uh, you know, have they got their separate butter? Are they cooking lots of things in the same oven with other things that have gluten in them? And looking at the TTG. So if they all look good, we go, OK, that looks good. Um, we are developing. So there's a lot of scientists are researching tests that are a bit more accurate. So there is going to be in hopefully the very near future, a, a basically a pee on a stick test that you're going to be able to do. It's called GIP. Um, it means gluten immunopeptides, but it helps if you think of it as gluten in P, so GIP. So you'll be able to basically dip, do a dipstick on it um, and that will tell you very accurately if there's gluten in what you've eaten recently. And that test is really accurate and it should be actually available quite soon we thought it would be out this year to be honest so hopefully it'll be available soon so that's something that you can actually get yourselves or that your doctor or your dietitian will be able to check for you so the ttg gives you a clue if it is low you're feeling well you know that's a good chance that you've no gluten coming in but i would say it's not a hundred percent um unfortunately now 
Sarah, my eight-year-old son has just had a negative blood test, but his two sisters are celiacs. He is symptomatic. Should I pursue this? I would be inclined to, to be honest. Um, looking at what his symptoms are and having um, the, the symptoms with it um, and his sisters being celiac, yes, possibly. Now, it depends. If he's been to see, like if he's got in to see a gastroenterologist and the gastroenterologist has really checked it out, maybe come back. Sometimes what happens is people have sort of nearly what we call pre-celiac disease. They're sort of having a few symptoms, but it's not showing up in blood tests yet. Um, now, I'd imagine your GP, when they did, it should have checked his IgA levels and his EMA levels as well. So he might just need um, another test sometimes. But again, I'd maybe check in with the doctor. I'm assuming your doctor has done everything correctly. Um, but maybe just if he is having symptoms, I'd write them down. And it's very useful, particularly when you're going to doctors, to have the date, the time, the symptoms. So were they getting bloating, were they getting diarrhea, constipation, pain in the tummy, what was happening? Because it's good to have that sort of tracked with it as well. Um, but as I said, you know, maybe just have a chat that, as I said, if some people will be negative on the blood test, even if they are celiac. Now, usually that will run in families too. So usually if he was negative on the blood test, his sisters probably would have been as well. Or it might be a thing that you're going to wait a little while and check again and maybe just keep an eye on his growth um, and make sure that he's growing properly and so on. So maybe just check in. But if you want to um, email into the Celiac Society, I can maybe come back and give you a shout directly and just have a chat through it with you. And um, if you just email them and just say you want to have a chat with me and I'll come back to you um, on that. Now, this is my daughter's hand. She's celiac for two years. Does it look like the rationale? I don't have the picture. Do I? Hang on. The picture hasn't come up for me, so I apologize. Again, if you want to try and email that into the society, I'll have a look at that. So info at celiac.ie um, and I'll check out. I'm sorry, the rash just isn't coming up for me at the moment, but I can have a look. Um, so it can, as I said, it can take two years with it. Now, we, again, we can have lots of other rashes. We're not always just going to get the one, but I'll, I will have a look at that for you if you send it in. Hi, Sarah. We recently had a daughter diagnosed through a blood test with celiac disease. We also have family members with it. The doctor told us to on a gluten-free diet now. Um, she's no obvious symptoms. The waiting list to see a specialist is more than a year. Should we put her on a gluten-free diet now? Yes, at the moment, I would. Um, the big problem is, is trying to, is the long wait. Um, I mean, we do encourage doctors as much as possible, particularly with celiac disease and particularly with kind of coming on and off the gluten-free diet to, as if they can do anything to get to see a specialist sooner rather than later but there's limited I know everything is a bit up in the air at the moment so if it is going to be a year to see a specialist yes I would take her off the gluten the problem is she's going to have to go back on it before she has more tests with the specialist and that's actually can be quite difficult um, but if it is that long a wait I would be inclined to do it for that at the moment and um, again if you want to get in touch with me I can talk to you more directly about that. I'm still confused by barley malt extract. Is it like oatmeal in that it bothers some and not others? Okay, barley is the most confusing thing that I think people come across with celiac disease. We have questions on it constantly. Okay, so barley it has gluten. So barley is a problem. Barley malt is, is barley that's been a little bit fermented. So some of the gluten is broken down, but unfortunately it is still there. So barley malt is out, okay? So it's not like oats. Um, oats has a protein called avenin, which only reacts in about 5% of people with celiac disease. The particular protein in barley is called hordine and it reacts in everybody with celiac disease. So most people are going to have a good, strong reaction, pretty much everybody to even to the barley malt extract. Now, what can happen sometimes is the amount of barley malt extract in the food is so tiny that when they test it for gluten, it's below a level, but it does need to say gluten free. So even if sometimes you might see barley in an ingredient list, but the product says gluten-free and that's why this, it's in so tiny that when they've tested it, it's not at a level that's a problem. And you might think, how does, how does it get that little? So it's usually what it is, where I've seen it most commonly is someone is making a shepherd's pie, they put a dash of Worcestershire sauce in it. Worcestershire sauce has a little bit of barley in it, but the tiny dash of Worcestershire sauce into the whole shepherd's pie, the actual amount of barley is so tiny, it's not having an impact on it. But in general, barley malt in foods that don't say gluten-free is, is an issue. So things like breakfast cereals that have barley malt in them, unfortunately, you do still need to avoid. Um, I'd love a copy of the slides too. Just diagnosed last month and have three children of childbearing ages, one in particular who suffers. Now the, the message isn't finished there, but um, yeah, I mean, we certainly have this here. We have information on the website as well, um, but we will be doing more talks in the future. So absolutely, we can, we can put this up on the website for people to have a look at. But if you're just diagnosed, I hope you got some good information there, but we have, we'll be doing other talks now over the next few months. So do come back and join us um, for them. Um, Sarah, how come I can eat some gluten-free bread, but other gluten-free bread gives me a terrible reaction? So, I mean, it really depends on other ingredients in there. I mean, what I do find is that for some people, 
Um, so if we look at something like wheat, it's going to have gluten in it, but wheat also has a thing in it called fructan, which for, again, for the vast majority of people, is absolutely fine. But for some people, the fructan will give them maybe some bloating and make them feel uncomfortable. So possibly if you're eating bread that's low in wheat as well as low in gluten, because sometimes you can get bread that has wheat in it, but the gluten is removed. So maybe just check those two out. Sometimes it's just some of them have much higher levels of fiber than others. So you might get some gluten free breads that maybe have one or two grams of fiber, and then you can get others that might have nine grams of fiber. And if you don't normally eat a whole lot of fiber and you suddenly throw two slices of bread in, putting in 18 grams, which is a lot, um, I'd expect you to have a bit of a funny tummy. So it might just be your body getting used to the fiber as well. So it can be just quite a few different things. But what I would say is if some of the gluten free bread is working for you, if you can stick with that one, maybe um, that might do the trick for you. If as a celiac you ingest gluten, for example, contaminated gluten free food in a restaurant, does it damage you as much as if you were full time back on gluten? No, it doesn't. Um, definitely not. Thank goodness. So now, I mean, there's always one person out of all the millions who might have a very, very severe response to it. And I, I'm thinking of one child in particular, but for the vast majority of people, it's it's less damaging and it recovers quite quickly. It's not the same as having been back on gluten for five years. So I wouldn't be panicked about that with it. Now, I would say I'd love to see a little bit more research in that area, to be honest. Um, but generally, you know, just I know you're not going to feel well, but just let it, it should be fine and it should come back to normal for you. Speaking of grandparents, um, Gran asked if corn was OK. Yes, corn is absolutely fine. But what, again, you're just checking cross contamination. Um, up to last year, corn flour was all gluten free, but we now know that there's, I think it's shamrock gluten free, and I apologize to shamrock if it's not you, but I think shamrock gluten free or shamrock corn flour does now have a little bit of gluten in it. So just again, with your corn flour, just check what's in the book about what's safe for you there. Um, but corn, so sweet corn, popcorn, as long as again, if it's made gluten free, if you're making it yourself, it should be okay. I know I'm starting to see in the last few months, and I'm sure many of you from celiac for years, a lot more foods that would be naturally gluten free suddenly starting to carry and may contain label like lentils is one we're seeing a lot. I even saw it on quinoa yesterday. So we're, we're looking into that in terms of just finding out what the story is why suddenly we're seeing a whole lot more. Um, but corn itself is naturally gluten free. You're just checking for cross contamination. I remember people saying, well, maybe you could just eat a cream cracker. There's nothing in that. I know. I think look, people don't set out to be um, difficult with this, but I think sometimes people genuinely don't understand. And we see a lot of confusion where someone might know someone with celiac who reacts very badly to food and someone with celiac disease who doesn't. And they're kind of going, oh, well, you're just faking it or you're messing. You know, I'm sure some of you have come across that one. So, yeah, people, um, they don't always get that the tiny because that's when I talk about the 20 millionths sometimes people start to understand or I'd say it's a little bit like a peanut allergy in that for some people even breathing it in and uh, first gluten no um but for some you know even tiny tiny amounts of peanut will trigger a reaction you go it's the same with celiac disease only you're not going to get anaphylaxis from it Hi, my husband and four boys just recently tested positive for celiac disease, so it's all new in our house. What advice can you give me starting out and also what are all allergens to stay clear of? Well, you only need to avoid the gluten. So don't worry about other allergens like dairy, all the rest. They're going to be absolutely fine for you with that, unless you have a specific allergy. But it's it's unusual with that. It does happen, but it's unusual. Um, my big advice to you is make sure you get in to see the dietitian as soon as possible. Get your doctor to refer you to the HSE dietitian. The community dietitians in your area will be able to see you free of charge. Um, as I said, we have the celiac clinic and you're more than welcome to book in with us. There is a charge for that, unfortunately, but it's reduced rates for members. Um, but definitely sit down with the dietitian and go through it have a look at some of the information on the website um, and go from there but your big thing for you particularly with four boys because I don't know how old they are and you might just you're going to need someone to check them out just for their weight their height their growth and make sure that that's all okay and nice and steady with it but god love you five of them um all in one go with that so you're going to be a nice gluten-free household very quickly um so yeah, look, so look out for ball. So yes, yeah, someone was just responded to another question, Sarah. Now, um, Sarah, how do we become celiac? What did we do to put us in this situation? So first of all, nothing. You didn't do anything. And um, this is definitely nobody's fault. So celiac disease is genetic. OK, if you're going to blame anybody, you can blame your parents for giving you the genes, but they were probably celiac as well. Um, so it's genetic. And about 30 percent of people in Ireland carry the genes to become celiac. So what we have is we have the genes to be celiac and then we have a trigger. And what we don't know is what the trigger is. And we actually don't know. We think it's a virus. Um, but we're really not sure. 
Um, there's lots and lots of studies because obviously if we can find out what the trigger is and do something about that, that would just be amazing. Um, and it just people wouldn't develop it. So we don't know, but you haven't done anything. You didn't do anything. This is definitely not your fault. So it's it's just unfortunate. It is it and it is um just genetic with it. Um, I'm celiac for 48 years and I've never had a checkup. Oh, you're going to give me palpitations with that. OK, the doc doesn't seem to bother to check me out. I never met a dietitian and I've never had a bone, a DEXA's test. Should the doctor be better informed? I'm asymptomatic, so it's easy to ignore. What test do I go for? Is the same battery of tests for family members? Look, OK, so yeah, will you go and just get your bloods checked? So what you I would say to you, um, just go and get your back to your GP. So you're going to get your TTGs done. So that's your main celiac test. So we're going to see where that is. Um, I would love you to do your vitamin D, your vitamin B12, your folic acid, okay, and get your thyroid checked as well. About 12% of people with celiac disease will also have an underactive thyroid. And you can feel very unwell with that. So that's always worth checking out. Um, I don't know how old you are, but I'm guessing if you're 48 years of celiac, it's definitely time for a bone scan. So, I mean, what we do find is most doctors are well informed, but I also I often feel very sorry for GPs because they have such a vast amount of information that they have to kind of keep going all the time. It's difficult. There is actually, we just worked, so the Celiac Society worked very closely with the ICGP in last year, and we published just earlier this year the new guidelines for GPs for diagnosing and managing um, celiac disease. So you can let your GP know that they're there. They're, they're on the ICGP website website um, for doctors to, to do. You can actually Google it and find it yourself and print them off and bring them in if you want. Um, but for you, definitely those tests. So I'm going to go through them again in case you didn't get them. So you want your TTGs, vitamin B12, folic acid, vitamin D, and your thyroid check and get your iron checked as well. And then go definitely book yourself in for a DEXA scan for you um, and just check. So even if you're asymptomatic, um, I, I don't know whether you're on gluten or not, but I'd be inclined just to check it out um, for yourself and see how you're doing. Now, how long after starting the gluten-free diet does the tendency towards getting osteoporosis dissipate? So that's a really good question. And what I don't have is a straight answer on it. Um, for children, we don't worry about it because we do know their bones bounce back. With osteoporosis, if you have a tendency towards it, Basically, there's two issues with celiac disease and bones. One is if your gut is quite damaged and you're not absorbing your vitamin D and your calcium, that's one cause of the osteoporosis. But the other cause, as I mentioned, is some of those TTG molecules we think are directly attacking the bone as well. So there's a little bit of the two going on with it. So the risk for osteoporosis is always higher in everybody with celiac disease, even when you're on the gluten free diet. So that's one of the reasons why I would say you have to see your dietitian. You have to get your diet checked for calcium because you, I very, very rarely meet someone with celiac disease who's actually eating enough calcium. You're a disaster. All right. Will you ever eat your drink your milk and eat your yogurt? And if you're just not doing that, will you please have a good think about um, a calcium supplement or would you go and see your dietitian if it's been a few years and get your calcium levels checked? Please don't rely on green vegetables for calcium. They do have calcium, but you'd want to be eating 16 servings of broccoli a day, right? So I doubt any of you are doing that. So will you please, please, please look after your calcium and take your vitamin D supplement? Um, so the tendency to answer your question is always there. Um, so you will, you, you know, when you're diagnosed with celiac disease as an adult, um, you need a bone scan. And if everything is wonderful, absolutely fine. Carry on till for women, the menopause, men around 55, and then you're going to have your bone scan repeated. And it's just to check it out for you. Um, wow, someone's saying my doctor refers me to a dietitian yearly. I'd find a different doctor. Well, I tell you, that's fairly unique. Fair play to you if you have a doctor who's referring you to a dietitian every year. Um, I'm 24 years old, diagnosed celiac for the last six years. Would it be a good idea to go for the bone test? Um, 18 diagnosed. Hmm. You're kind of on the cusp. You're probably OK. Um, I mean, in theory, yes, the best thing to do would be to get it checked, but maybe just check with your GP. Um, God, you're right on the edge with that. I'd be inclined to just check in with your GP and just, you know, say that we usually recommend it for adults. And from a medical point of view, we generally consider an adult from 16. So maybe just check in with your GP and just see what they think on it. It might be any harm if you have the health insurance to go and get it done yourself and just see. Um, I seem to get a reaction 36 hours after inadvertently eating gluten. Is this non-celiac gluten intolerance? Now, if you're celiac, it's probably celiac disease. If you are not celiac and it's been definitely ruled out and you were definitely eating gluten at the time that you were having your celiac test, it could very possibly be non-celiac gluten intolerance. Because of the long delay, it'd be hard to figure out. So what I would be doing there is keeping a very detailed food and symptom diary for about six weeks and really just looking, are you definitely 
gluten and then 36 hours later now you sound like you do know but for yourself i would check in and just look and see is there something else that might be doing it um you know food reactions can be so complicated and if you're not sure again check in with a coru registered dietitian um and there's a list at sedi.ie so s-e-d-i.ie um, just to make sure you do see someone who's coru registered because they're going to be really well qualified um, and they might be able to help you pinpoint what's going on there as well um yeah someone's just saying i'm convinced that it was stress that triggered celiac disease i've heard a couple of people say that so i you know i wonder um but as i said in terms of the big research in terms of what might trigger celiac disease it, it seems like it's likely to be a virus but i to be honest, i wouldn't rule anything out the human body is wonderfully complex and complicated now if a chocolate bar has no gluten in the list of ingredients or in the may contain list is it okay to eat even if it's not on the gluten-free food list now there's a question we do know, say, from talking to some of the chocolate bar companies that um, they might say that there's nothing on the label, there's no may contain, but we still won't put them into the food list because we won't stand over them as being gluten free or suitable for celiacs. So that does cause confusion with that. So to be honest, I would, as a dietitian, love you to pick what's in the book rather than others. And um, even if it does, I know, and you know it does limit what you can have, but we definitely have a couple of chocolate bar companies where there's nothing on the label mentioning gluten, but they will not stand over them to go into the book for us to say that they're suitable for celiacs. So I would just be really careful there, unfortunately. Um, I'm in a similar boat. I was diagnosed very young and have to insist on certain things like my bloods to ask your GP to put you down for DEXA, which is great. And if you're sticking to your diet and you're not asymptomatic, um, you know, you're managing it. I've never seen a dietitian, but I'm totally well, good. As I said, some people will do brilliantly with it, but I think particularly starting off, it's fantastic if you can just get the advice for yourselves with it. Um, with someone newly diagnosed, we need to watch out for things in our kitchen as well. Should I be buying new pans, etc.? So in your kitchen, what you're going to look out for, no, you generally don't need to rush out and buy a whole load of new things. Now, I was looking at something recently and they were talking about nonstick pans and that if they get scratches, sometimes the gluten can be in there. I don't know some, I'd, I'd love to see more studies to go for definite. So I don't know on that, but in terms of kind of using, what you're going to look out for is wooden bread and breadboards. Cause if you cut, you know, the way it goes into the wood a little bit, sometimes the crumbs can be in there. So you're looking for separate breadboards or what I'd often recommend is that you use with a glass breadboards that can go into the dishwasher. Um, but you don't need to be buying new everything else. You just need to be careful. Where I see people often picking up um, gluten would be, particularly if there's kids in the house and they've kind of thrown a piece of bread onto the counter and made something with it and gone off without cleaning up and then you go to make something, it's contaminated. So we kind of say to wash down before you cook. Um, tea towels. Um, and again, if there's kids in the house, instead of washing their hands after they've handled something, they might just rub their hands in the tea towel and then you go to use it for something and then there's gluten all over the place. So it's kind of those just really talking to your dietitian about the cross contamination. But no, I will, we never actually tell anyone they need to go out and buy loads of new things. So no, you don't need to do that. Uh, someone's saying thanks Sarah very informative and I'm glad you're enjoying that um just wondering if you are diagnosed with celiac disease as an adult does that mean you are also celiac as a child not necessarily so the most common age to be diagnosed with celiac disease is between 40 and 60. now there will be some people who were celiac their whole life and it was just missed and usually there are people who are quite short really bad bones um things like that but actually it can just come on in life so as I said we don't know what the trigger is so the trigger can just come in at any time. So there's definitely people who even would have had celiac tests maybe 15 years ago and they were negative. And then later they test and they're positive. So it can actually just come on as an adult, although definitely there are some people who were just missed, um, particularly if they had constipation as a symptom, um, particularly for children that, that can be missed. I'm intolerant, but it's not more than an hour. It sounds, sorry, I think you're answering someone else there, sorry. Um, I was only diagnosed in my 50s, but I think I've been celiac since I was a child. I um, always had problems with small growing up and I still am. Very late periods, difficult to get him pregnant. Now have osteoporosis, does sound like you were. I mean, we can't know for definite, um, but yeah, that's, I mean, we would look, it was definitely, I was reading an interesting research paper recently and they were saying anyone under five foot four should be tested for celiac disease. And I thought that's a lot of people really. Um, so, I mean, you can be shorter for lots of reasons, but it was an interesting one with that, but you did seem to have got everything. Maybe there's no way, unfortunately, going back in time to know for sure, but possibly. Um, I've had both negative biopsy and blood test. However, I wasn't on a gluten containing diet. I wasn't advised at the time. So my GP advised, uh, diagnosed me with IBS and advised me to cut out gluten. I find after bread, I'm hit with severe stomach cramps, shaking and nausea within two to three hours. Would this be a good indicator for non-celiac gluten sensitivity? So the big problem there is that you weren't eating gluten when you were tested. So for all we know, you actually are celiac. Um, 
if the nice thing is you get quite a reaction. I mean, the ideal thing to do would be that you'd go back on the gluten for the six weeks, get the blood test and the biopsy done again. But I think you're not going to do that if you're having such a severe reaction. If you were, if we had, if you got the test where you're eating gluten and the blood test was negative and the biopsy was negative, then we would definitely look at, um, you know, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So it could be that. As I said, some people with could actually have a wheat allergy. So that's another thing to check. And your GP can look for that even if you're not eating wheat. Um, it's called an IgE. Now, not an IgG, which is the other test we were talking about, but an IgE for wheat. Now, do not get ev all your IgEs tested because you'll always be positive to some and you only actually have an allergy if you're positive on your IgE and a reaction. So if you're positive on your IgE and you don't have a reaction, you don't have an allergy. Um, but if you're IgE positive for the wheat, for example, and that's the reaction you're getting, maybe you have a wheat allergy, which it sounds like that's what you have. Because um, kind of two hours later, quite a reaction. It might be that as well. Now, I, I'm not a doctor and I can't diagnose you with that. So I'd be looking at maybe check out for the wheat allergy. I don't think you're going to go back onto the gluten um, in terms of having the biopsy done. So you might be celiac. So in that case, I would be inclined to sort of live as if you were celiac. So just be really strict, get your bone scan, get your bloods checked and things like that as well. And make sure that like that, I'm sure you are anyway, fully avoiding the gluten for it. Um, we were only referred to dietitian when first diagnosed nearly seven years ago. Should we get another referral? Um, the recommendation is once a year. Um, it's probably no harm after even seven years just to check in and just get the diet checked. And as I said, not just for the gluten, but also for your calcium, your vitamin D, get all of those things checked as well. So if you can, I would. As I said, your community dietitians can see you and your GP can refer you. And um, can you advise on gluten free oats? They are not recommended in Australia, where a lot of research supports this view. Now, I have to say the advice on oats changes on a regular basis. Um, so what it has been steady at, certainly in Europe and in the US for the last few years, is that um, we do know that 5% of people with celiac disease react to oats, but 95% don't. The only problem is, as you all know, oats can be contaminated with gluten. So the 95% of people with celiac disease who are eating gluten-free oats, their TTGs are fine. We're not seeing damage to the gut with that. So it seems to be absolutely fine there. 5% obviously are having the reaction and that's an issue. So um, I'm not actually 100% sure what's going on in Australia with that, but I'll look it up. Um, um, I mean, certainly here until recently, it was recommended that you avoid them as well. So at the moment, um, the research is saying that it seems to be fine for most people. Um, so if you're eating them and you're having symptoms and your TTGs are going up, maybe come off them. But for other people, it seems to be fine. And it does introduce more nutrition into the diet for people who have them. But I will look up the Australia side of things and see what's going on there. Um, I'm conscious we have 60 more questions. I'm not going to get to all of them before two o'clock, but I'll, I'll rush through what I can. So one of the questions here is, I get hugely frustrated about gluten-free food containing oats or oat flour. I've had horrible reactions to accidentally eating these, and I'm aware I'm very reactive to oats. I wish the declaration was gluten-free but contains oats. Absolutely. Um, and I'm with you on that. I think it would be very, very useful for it because you do need to check out the oats if you are someone who reacts um, with it. It would be helpful. It should be in the ingredient list, though. If you are if you're kind of getting something like that, um, the oats should be highlighted in bold. So even if they're gluten free, it should still say it in bold for, for you um, with that if you have a check on the ingredient list. Um, my 12 year old son is recently diagnosed. We've had a takeaway from Subway recently and I told them it was for celiacs. So they use different utensils, etc. Um, cooked on baking, baking paper in a separate tray, but in the same oven. Is this safe? Um, should be fine um, with that, as long as there wasn't something in the oven at the same time. It's, it's very hard to know because sometimes you might get minute bits of gluten with it, um, but I'd say you're probably okay with that one, unless I actually took the sandwich and, and did a lab test. I'm not going to know for sure, but I, I think you're probably all right with that one. Um, picked up because he was a type 1 diabetic. Yeah, that's, oh, God love you trying to manage both. Um, it's tough, but I do find kids' blood sugars do tend to stabilize really well if they are if they were undiagnosed celiac with diabetes. It, it tends to help, but I know it's more restriction again. Um, I don't envy you that one. Um, can digestive enzymes help with gut issues? They can, but I wouldn't be spending a huge fortune on them. One that I would use if someone is lactose intolerant, they do need to avoid lactose, but sometimes it turns up in random foods. So you might, some of the lactase enzymes can be quite helpful, but you need to take them at the same time as the food. Now, they are not going to work if you had like a big glass of milk. They won't do anything, but it'd be more if someone was out and they were eating something and there was a little bit of milk in it. It might just help to stop reactions. So I know one of my kids um, 
is lactose intolerant. So if we're eating out, we'll often just give him a couple of them um, because he's more likely to come home bloated. Even if you, you know, now he's not allergic to milk, so we tend not to be very obsessive about it. Um, but, you know, might have pancakes or something like that. They could have a bit of milk in it. Um, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2019 and celiac disease in March 2020. We're at least eight months, 100% gluten-free, but he's still cramping, especially in the morning. Do you have advice? Um, I'm sure you've seen the dietitian there, but I maybe just check back up. What can sometimes happen is a lot of kids in particular, when they go on the gluten-free diet, their fiber levels often fall and they can get quite constipated. So um, I don't know how old he is. He mightn't thank you, but if you can, sorry about this now, have a look at his poo. And if it's coming out in kind of hard lumps, he's probably constipated and that will give him some cramps as well. So it might be that he needs to increase his fiber. So maybe just pop back to his dietitian, his diabetes dietitian, and just get her to check him for fiber and just check that out because she'll definitely be able to do that for him. I would I would look there, to be honest, um, for it. Would you advise supplements for teenage girl with celiac disease just diagnosed? Um, I would really, really, really have a look at her calcium. Um, and as a teenage girl, she's going to need five servings of dairy a day, um, which is hard work at the best of times. And you, I, maybe she may or may not be lactose intolerant as well. So I'd be straight into the dietitian for that. Get her calcium checked. She may need a calcium supplement. She definitely need a vitamin D supplement. Um, some people newly diagnosed might need a B vitamin supplement as well. Some might need zinc. We don't routinely test them, so it's hard to know. But I would really right there would be vitamin D and check out for the calcium and see does she need a supplement for that. Tips to increase fiber as a celiac. Um, your nuts and seeds are brilliant. Um, so a spoonful or two of seeds into breakfast cereal or into yogurts and um, things that is really good. Beans and lentils are really, really good for fiber. They're very high. Again, most of them, they are naturally gluten-free, but it, the lentils recently, I'm just starting to see may contain gluten on more and more lentils. Um, and it's to do with the harvesting and farming of them. Um, so it's a bit of a nuisance. But if you have a look, the lentils, once they don't say may contain, should be fine. And I know I'm, I'm nearly saying that I'm, we'll have them. I'm going to check them out and we're trying to just get specific brands and we'll add them as an addition to the food list shortly because it is becoming an area of frustration for an awful lot of people with it. Um, but your beans, your lentils, your nuts and seeds, they're all going to be really good. Your fruit and veg will be brilliant. So if you're getting your sort of five to seven servings of fruit and veg a day, that's and they're the big ones that I'd look at for fiber with them. Um, are spices gluten free like paprika and chili powder? So. Yes, they are naturally gluten free. What you're looking at is, are they being cross contaminated when they're being packaged? And that's where we do see an issue with it. So most of them should be gluten free. Um, the difficulty we often have is getting food manufacturers to actually come back to us with the information to confirm that there's no cross contamination. So that's why sometimes you don't have a huge list of them in the food list, but we're really working hard to try. <laughs> The, the, I suppose the problem with the food list is you can't force food manufacturers to, to put the food in, but we're, we're working on it um, with that. So on their own, yes, they are gluten free, but there is just cross contamination risks. So that's one of the things that we just keep an eye on. Do we need to take supplements in general? Probably not. But if you're celiac, I really would be taking a vitamin D. And to be honest, I recommend that for everybody. Um, but if you wanted to take a sort of a general multivitamin, that's just a bit of a top up. There's no problem to do that as well. And most of those will have vitamin D in there as well. Um, why do the UK Celiac Society have different measurements of gluten when testing foods? I don't think that they do, to be honest. Um, they would look as far as I know, under they'd, they'd be under the same EU legislation that we are, so um, certainly at the moment. Um, so it's the 20 parts per million if they're looking at gluten-free foods, so they should be the same. Sometimes where we would see a difference is that the UK food list, for example, just goes off what's on the label. So they will look at ingredients and if there's no may, nothing in the ingredients and no may contain, it goes into their food list. Whereas we actually go to the manufacturer and go, is there definitely nothing in here? What's on the line? What's your house of control? So we would do more checks, which means that sometimes you will see foods on the UK list that aren't on the Irish list. Now, sometimes it can be something is manufactured in two different places and there's gluten in one factory and not in another. So that's also why there might be differences. But in terms of the actual um, testing, they should be <laughs> OK, it's going to have to be our last question. And um, just to say St. James's Hospital looked after refractory celiac disease. I was taught that the tip of a needle of gluten will stay in your system for about nine weeks. Wow, that's actually very interesting. Um, it's a lovely description of it. Um, and thank you to the Celiac Society for all your help and information over the years. Well, thank you. I, I'm conscious there's absolutely loads more um, questions there. I'm just not going to get to them, but we will be doing um, another webinar in about four weeks. So if you have a look, we'll email everybody out about that. So if you want to come back and have a chat, and I think if we've that many questions, we might see if we can just run a Q&A session 
um, someday for people. So look, thank you so much for coming. It's absolutely lovely to have everybody here today. And I know some familiar faces there. I'm, get, I'm getting to know you all bit by bit over the three years. Um, but look, we will talk to you soon. And I really hope you enjoyed it. And best of luck with that. So yeah, take care. Sarah, Bye -bye. can I just interject and say sure. that Awareness Week is happening. This the, We commence on the 8th of May and we're covering off more topics. There's more talks. So please come and join us, register, um, and we can cover off more subjects. So, yeah. and thanks and again it's free. for everybody. So everybody come along. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.